Welcome to the Swayam portal of online refresher course in philosophy under MHRD Government of India. Today we will discuss about module on the theme a plea for comparative method. The comprehension of the significance of the non-comparison in philosophy is determined by the meaning of the term comparison. Without paying attention to the meaning of this term, many scholars have founded their superstitious belief in the meaninglessness of comparative philosophy or comparative method. This widespread belief seems to derive its force from the following three premises. Philosophical works are examples of historical events. They can be understood by paying attention to their intentional, linguistic and spatio-temporal structures. Intention constitutes the insight of a particular work, whereas its outside is given in terms of the later two structures. Natural events have only outsides, historical events have insights as well as outsides. A philosophical work can be understood in the gamut of the historical events provided that we pay attention to its inside and outside. This requires a non-comparative rather than a comparative method. Moreover, comparison may be taken in the sense of similarity, but even in this sense, Comparison between systems belonging to different editions or families is not justified. Comparison is justified to some extent in the case of philosophies belonging to same radiation or family. Comparison is an intraworldly phenomenon. Thirdly, even if one takes comparison in the sense of evaluation, he should base evaluation on internal criticism rather than on external criticism. The goal of evaluation lies in the proving of consistency or inconsistency of a system. So we should evaluate a system within its own boundaries. Even in this sense, one should proceed in a non-comparative way. A comparative study is nothing but another name for the misinterpretation of the philosophies. In this module, I have tried to argue against the above premises on the following ground. Comparative studies generates the question different from a non-comparative method. A particular structure of a work is visible only in the light of a particular question. So certain aspects of a philosophical work may remain hidden unless we adopt the comparative method. Similarity between philosophies sharing the same background is less valuable than the similarity found between philosophies having different backgrounds. Because in the later case, similarity is not the trivial, it seems to have got deeper roots in the collective unconscious or superconsciousness of human beings. Comparison is coterminous with our conceptual consciousness. The only alternative left to us is to choose between closed and open comparisons. The comparative philosophy derives its legitimacy from open comparison. Now the question arises, why comparative study? Are we justified in quoting a slok from the Gita if our knowledge of Gita is limited to only that shlok? If the answer is affirmative, then the meaningfulness of the comparative study has to be accepted. Should we analyze the quote, the Gita, in the situations imagined by Vedvyas? If that is so, then Gita should be prescribed only in the department of history. The meaningfulness of Gita can be restored only by pointing out and discovering its value in the circumstances unimagined by its author. Our quotation of a shalok from the Gita is justified because creation is alienation for a being that is not omniscient. Alienation is a dialectical relation between the creator and the created objects. Created objects is determined by creator because it is he who created the object. But it is also independent of him in the sense that it has become a part of the outer world or the part of the consciousness at large. Its appreciation, evaluation and meaningful use are the functions of consciousness at large. The created object is dependent on the creator for its existence. But so far as its function is concerned, it is beyond the control of its creator. The alienation is reduced to null for a being that is omniscient. But for us, it is more than a fact. It is structural property of our world of creation. 
it is impossible to create significantly without being alienated. To create significantly is to use significant sign and signs as a cashier points out is no mere accidental clock of idea but its necessary essential organ. It serves not merely to communicate a complete and given thought content but is an instrument by means of which this content develops and fully defines itself. What is implied is that a sign is the locus of descriptive as well as suggestive meanings. One can understand the descriptive meaning of a sign by paying attention to philological study. But its deeper implications which are contained in symbolic part can be understood in the context of non-philological questions. Revelation is always a controlled revelation and this controlling is carried out in the dimension of questions. Symbolic understanding is not an exception to this. This phenomenon preserves the meaningfulness of history. Otherwise, after a certain period, history would be a record of repetitive events. As question varies, the relation between signs of a work appears in a different light and discloses the symbolic meaning unknown to its author. Kant rightly remarks, it is by no means unusual upon comparing the thoughts which an author has expressed in regard to his subject. To find that we understand him better and then he has understood himself. This is precisely because of the fact that deeper concepts of human beings are found in the hermeneutic field. This field as Paul Ricoeur points out is the field of double meanings. To understand a sign is to view it in the light of a quotient. To quotient is really to adopt a methodology. Comparative methodology or comparative goal is controlled by comparative quotients. By arresting the function of consciousness in a way different from the non-comparative study, comparative quotients disclose the structures of philosophies unseen in a non-comparative horizon. Now, what is a comparative quotient? The common understanding understands this quotient in terms of similarity between philosophies. The answer to this question in the case of philosophies belonging to same tradition is justified because of the obviousness of similarity. Comparison between philosophies belonging to different tradition is not justified as their similarity is not so obvious. But the above argument proves just the opposite of what it wants to prove. If the similarity between the objects of comparison is too obvious, the question of comparison does not arise. Not only new knowledge arises out of wonder, but it also packed with wonder. Even in the case of tautological argument, the relation between premises and conclusion is not so obvious. Otherwise, there would be pointless points in proving the theorems of mathematics and logic. On the other hand, if dissimilarity is the transparent at the very outset, our situation remains the same. In order to get out of this dilemma, one should accept the equal initial possibility of similarity and dissimilarity. It seems that the comparative quotient arises in the epistemological situation of doubt. If such a doubt arises, even in the case of philosophies, unconnected by the means of tradition, then the comparative inquiry is justified. One may deny the value of comparative philosophy without denying its knowledge goal. Comparative study is useless because it tries to show connection between unconnected works. But if one gives value to beauty, order and perfection, then he is bound to give value to comparative philosophy. Comparison in the sense of similarity is the expression of symmetry, says Dagobert Frey in an article on the problem of symmetry in art signifies rest and binding, asymmetry motion and loosening the one order and the law other arbitrariness and accident. The love for symmetry is the very basis of Indian philosophical systems. Shunyata of the Buddhist, Brahman of the Advaitins are nothing but the units in which the human love for symmetry has found expression. It seems that we cannot uproot our roots from symmetry. Self, reason, freedom, 
determinism etc are simply the modes for the expression of symmetry it is love for symmetry which gives impetus to comparative philosophy the discovery of similarity between the philosophies sharing the same background is less valuable than the discovery of similarity between philosophies having different backgrounds because in the later case similarity is not trivial to say that face is like face is a trivial example of similarity in non trivial cases difference between objects of similarity seems to be necessary to say that the face is like moon is a non trivial example of similarity that is why mukta valika puts the condition of difference for the objects of similarity in the definition of similarity it is difference among the objects of comparison which is responsible for the creation of imaginative fields for poets scientists philosophers etc deduction and induction are methods of learning and demonstrating for others they are not methods of vision it is imagination controlled by questions that opens the new doors of understanding for oneself imagination says albert einstein is more important than knowledge it is strictly speaking a real factor in scientific research by extending the conclusion of einstein one can assert that it is a real factor in any type of research then difference between tradition would create only imaginative difficulty without creating the real problems difference of traditions or distances in space time between philosophies are bridged by imagination and similarity explicated with the help of abstract concepts for example to say that shunyata brahman and diva are similar is to use the abstract notion of symmetry itself if one lacks the understandings of this concept then he is justified in maintaining the difference among above concepts proper concepts are eye glasses which improve our vision if we lack them we would not be able to see the aspects of objects even when they are present before our eyes with the help of general concepts comparative philosophy tries to understand deeper dimensions of our collective unconsciousness or superconsciousness or material consciousness it tries to transcend the boundaries of traditions or persons because of its nets in impersonal and objective horizons the kantian regulative idea of homogeneity is significant not only for science but also for philosophy we are really trying to understand the philosophical implications of the truth that the earth is round comparative philosophy aims at the realization of being as round or being as truth in the sense of heidegger it finds it difficult fulfillment in the experience of truth as simultaneous revelation and concealment it is revealed because its expression in a particular system it is hidden because of the conceptual jargons of a particular system in this sense it is a basic mode of philosophizing which reveals the essence of truth as untruth so far we are inquiring into the consequence of defining comparison in terms of similarity but if we are going to compare more than two system then comparison should be understood in terms of equivalence relation in that case its domain would be able to satisfy the conditions of reflexes symmetry and transitivity we are concerned here with equivalence relation because it has a property which is very important from the viewpoint of a comparative study and would be able to create a problem for the supporters of non comparative study an equivalence relation in a class determines a natural partition of that class and a natural partition of a class give us equivalence relation partition or division of a class into non empty disjoint subclasses is associated with the division of the above type of subclasses the supporters of non comparative study favors the division of philosophy into two disjoint subclasses of indian philosophy and western philosophy but they deny the comparison they cannot do this to divide the philosophy means to group all the system of indian philosophy or western philosophy into a single head this can be based only on the on the behalf 
that Indian philosophical systems have at least similar property. Either this belief is without basis or it has got sonic reasonable basis. In former case, the very division of the philosophy into two classes is not justified. And on the ground of this unjustified belief, we cannot argue against the comparison between Indian philosophy and Western philosophy. On the other hand, if the belief has got some basis, then we should modify our conclusion that the comparative study is justified to some extent in the case of Indian philosophy. We should rather say that comparative study is justified to full extent in the case of Indian philosophy. Partition and equivalence relation are two sides of the same coin. If one is consistent, he cannot deny comparison after accepting division. I have tried to explain the significance of comparison in the domain of philosophy on the ground of its usual understanding. But comparison is also used in the sense of evaluation. To talk about the degree of comparison in the case of adjective is an example of its evaluation use. In this sense, this term is also used in the mathematical writings. We find there the mile of comparison for numbers. The rule is that for any two given numbers, it is possible to establish that whether one is greater than the other or less than the other or equal to the other. It is the rule of comparison which makes possible the operations of addition and subtraction in numbers. If we take comparison in this sense, then comparison becomes the basis of all significant thinking due to universality of the phenomena of addition and subtraction. All thinking says hopes in Leviathan is nothing but reckoning that is adding and subtracting. Hobbes goes on saying in sums in what matters soever there is a place for addition and subtraction. There is a place for reason and where they have no place their reason has nothing all to do. To Hobbes non-trivial addition and subtraction are Coterminous with significant thinking devoid of repetition. If that is so, then comparison becomes the basis of all significant thinking because addition and subtraction are not possible without comparison. It is true that we cannot formulate clear and distinct rules of comparison in other branches of knowledge as we find in mathematics. But it is also impossible to avoid comparison as comparison lives in the very house of consciousness. Consciousness is selective. Selection involves choice and choice is governed by comparison. Wherever there is a place for choice, there is a place for comparison. Comparison is the symbol of our freedom. We cannot give up comparison without giving up choice. Comparison is the mark of the intentionality of the conceptual consciousness. The real intentionality of conceptual consciousness does not lie in its directedness as conceived by Bretano and Husserl, but rather in the simultaneous consideration of several possible states of affairs or courses of events, as pointed out by Hintika. He says the putative solution to the problem of intentionality is mistaken. Intentionality is not a matter of relation obtaining within the world. It just lies in comparison between several possible worlds. It is an interworldly business and not an intraworldly business. If comparison is invariably connected with conceptual consciousness, then it is not possible to avoid comparison. The only alternative left to us is to choose between close comparison and open comparison. A non-comparative philosophy is also engaged in doing comparison, but within the boundaries of its own system. Further, from the viewpoint of comparison, philosophy can be divided into two groups, closed philosophy and open philosophy. Comparative philosophy is a subdivision of open philosophy. Comparison is an inter-system phenomenon for closed philosophy. In the case of open philosophy, it is an inter-system phenomenon. In the case of closed philosophy, comparison is always carried out within the boundary of that philosophy. In the case of open philosophy, the boundaries are not fixed. The relation between comparative philosophy 
and philosophy is not the same as the relation between comparative religion and religion. Comparative philosophy is a type of philosophy but comparative religion is not a type of religion. The relation between comparative religion and religion is external whereas relation is internal in the case of comparative philosophy and philosophy. Due to internality of relation, comparative philosophy is related to the philosophy by the mode of actuality, whereas comparative religion is related to religion by the mode of possibility. Since comparative philosophy is related to philosophy by the mode of actuality, it is mistaken for the misinterpretation of philosophies by the supporters of closed philosophy. Absolutely, closed philosophy is not a philosophy. It is rather a history of ideas. This is because the scope for addition and subtraction within the domain of an absolutely closed system is not much open. Pratikla, which is a real part of any inquiry, is reduced to a level of triviality in this case. For such a philosophy is always internal criticism. It is possible to get a consistent system by adopting the method of internal criticism. But internal criticism does not guarantee the relevance of the system. The relevance of a system can be demonstrated only by inter-system evaluation or by relating the system with the present modes of experience. To deny inter-system dialogue is to import religious dogmatism in the field of philosophy. And if we are in turning into a dialogue with other systems or other modes of experience, we are doing nothing but comparative philosophy. Now, what a closed philosophy wants to say is this, if A and B are philosophies, the dialogue between them is not a philosophy because it is neither wholly contained in A nor in B. What I want to say is this, since it is neither wholly contained in A nor in B, therefore it is a new phenomenon. It is a public dialogue which has got its own value. It is dependent on A and B for its creation but its function goes beyond A and B. Comparative philosophy is the expression of the alienated structures of closed philosophies. These alienated structures are visible only in the light of comparative function. A closed philosophy tries to understand comparative function in terms of the structures of the closed philosophy. That is why it denies the possibility of comparative philosophy. But if we try to understand structure in terms of function, the possibility of comparative philosophy seems to be absolutely evident. Comparative philosophy has two aspects, one definite, the other indefinite. The definite aspect that it is the philosophy of transcendence. The indefinite aspect is an unknown aspect and would be determined by the heterogeneous sequences generated by comparative philosophy. Here, transcendence should not be taken to mean the realization of some supreme goal beyond space and time. Transcendence is nothing but inter-categorical transmigration determined by evaluation. Transcendence is here determined by reference to the initial universe of discourse. There is no absolute transcendence in the field of homogeneity and definite aspect is homogeneous aspect. The assertion of the transcendence must not be taken to mean that comparative philosophy is without presuppositions. To talk without supposition is against the very nature of selective consciousness of human beings. The non-visibility of presupposition is not a guarantee of the absence of the presupposition. Discovery of presupposition is a matter of history. To talk about presupposition less philosophy is to ignore the moment of historical consciousness. Here, my disagreement with the basic premises of Hezraelian phenomenology is self-evident. The relation between presupposition and comparison is dialectical. Comparison is not possible without presupposition and the genuine presupposition is not possible without comparison. The relation between them is like the relation between sleeping and awakening. So finally, it is concluded that we have explained the meaning of comparison in two ways. Firstly, in terms of similarity and secondly, in the sense of evaluation. 
Actually, similarity is a specific result of evaluation. Since comparison is usually understood in the first sense, I have tried to explain this point separately. I have tried to show the limitation of closed philosophy because of its self evidence validity in the present day study of Indian philosophy. Our criticism of closed philosophy should not be taken to mean that it is without any value. It is most powerful method in the study of the particular dimensions of a philosophy. The general dimensions of a philosophy is more visible in the light of comparative philosophy. The method of each philosophy has got its own limitations and value. It seems that complementarily is the property of every method used in philosophy. If one wants to get one thing definitely by adopting a particular method, the other thing would appear as indefinite in the horizon of that method. From this point of view, each type of philosophy has got its own limitation. The limitation is rooted in the nature of selective consciousness itself. It is this limitation which gives meaning to social and historical basis of understanding and enters objective process of communication. Thank you.